nuclear plant inspectors throughout the United States who retaliated against, including in San Onofre, for speaking up. And we'll learn more about that later on in the conference. In other words, the inspectors who are supposed to safeguard our safety, the safety of the workers and the safety of the communities, are themselves being retaliated against for talking about the serious health and safety problems at these nuclear plants. This is illegal, it's a crime, and there's a cover-up going on. So our next speaker uh, has come to us from uh, Lethbridge, Canada. He's a professor of global studies, uh, Anthony Hall. And the way I found out about him uh, is I saw an article called From Hiroshima to Fukushima uh, by uh, Professor uh, Hall. And this showed the continuity uh, of, of nuclear power, nuclear energy, nuclear weapons, and why we have Fukushima today. So welcome, Professor Anthony Hall. I'm very pleased to be here today. And uh, this is uh, really one of the most uh, tragic things I've witnessed in my lifetime. I'm 60 years old, and the tragedy keeps compounding and getting worse. Uh, because as we try to... In try to just absorb the magnitude of what happened on March the 11th and now try to absorb the magnitude of the fact that we're being lied to, that this is being covered up, that here we have you know, one of the most lethal, devastating episodes, I think, in, in do we call it an industrial accident? the most devastating industrial accident ever? Well, in a way, we could, but it's a thoroughly predictable industrial accident. It's built, Fukushima and the other 54 plants in Japan are built on uh, earthquake, earthquake fault lines. And how did that happen, that the most dangerous technology known to humankind was put on such a imperiled geographic zone. And we know that if we don't deal with Fukushima, there are 20 Fukushimas lined up to go next. And the next ones are in California, because the same <coughs> negligence, the same uh, hubris uh, that resulted in the building of those plants on a dangerous geographic zone in Japan, the same uh, thing has happened here in California. So I must say I feel uh, almost uh, humbled and, uh, uh, you know, the responsibility of this moment, the few of us in this room, and I, I'm conscious of the fact that if you got to this room today, you probably know a lot about what's going on. And, uh, and, and we can see when we leave uh, a communion like this, when we go out in the street into our places of work, we find people with no idea what, what is going on. <clears throat> so so, the, so let's uh, try to t gather our courage a little bit because given uh, the knowledge that we, we, we have and that we're sharing here today, uh, there's a huge responsibility that goes on for it. I'm, I've, I'm just going to allow myself to go down this emotional road a little bit. I, it, this, uh, when I say it's one of the most consequential things I've witnessed in my lifetime, to, to deal with the fact that the possibilities of life have diminished. That we, there's no escaping this, there's no hiding from this, there's no pill to take, there's no uh, top to turn, uh, park to avoid, uh, and uh, I still, I think it bears repeating that this radioactivity, this new force, I mean it's an ancient force going back to the sun, it's in the universe, but this human created phenomena of radioactivity, you know, has such devastating consequences. We can talk about the cancers, the millions of cancers that will be created and that are being created every day, we don't deal with this in a much more serious way than leaving the little company that created the uh, configuration of, of menaces and hazards. That little company is still all that's in control 
That little company has no liability. The maximum liability is $2 billion. And if they can get a judge to say it was an act of God, they have no liability. So the people dealing with uh, the, the crisis are immune from the liability of what they're dealing with. And this concept of liability is, I think, the central theme that I want to uh, consider and reflect upon. Liability. How do we deal with liability? We deal with liability through insurance. Now we know the financial debacle that we're dealing with now, the uh, destruction of our economies through uh, an inside theft that a lot of uh, this uh, um, theft took place through playing with deregulation and insurance. The AIG company uh, ended up with all these so-called toxic assets and couldn't pay the insurance on the premiums they sold. And so the Federal Reserve, we the taxpayers, take over liability to pay out the bailouts, the bankers, who say, well, we're going to, you know, the economy will plunge tomorrow unless we get trillions uh, to cover these bad insurance policies. That's a knife to the throat. You know, either allow this to go forward or everybody's going to be out in the streets, there's going to be no paychecks, everything is going to freeze up. So the liability, who in their right mind would insure the nuclear energy plants of California? One of them on 13 fault lines, I understand. How can we even begin to imagine, how can we even begin to think in terms of dollars and cents for the kind of devastation that this nuclear accident in Fukushima is causing and the 20 other such accidents which we, if we allow these uh, thieves and criminals who are, are running our, 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 our situation and just saying, well, the people will always back us. We'll take the consequences of the radioactivity, our children's with cancer, our deformities, and we'll cover whatever financial uh, implications might come from all the negligence of this, this industry. Uh, so I, I, I thought about writing, I've been writing a lot uh, this, this autumn, uh, different uh, events. I, 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 I address 9-11 and what happened on 9-11. So I've been looking at another huge cover-up, an unimaginable cover-up. And, and you know, so, so in a way I think this, this uh, prepares me uh, for this subject. So, so this subject of, of liability, that those in control take all the profits and take to themselves, do we call them the 1%, the ruling class, the kleptocrats, uh, uh, basically this is a, a, psych, a psychotic uh, kind of so-called leadership that we have in place now. What, what words are there to, to, to find that? And, and I've held back from writing something down because coming to this region, coming to the Oakland Bay area, the Berkeley area, what I've been seeing on YouTube, my own uh, experience at Occupy London, at uh, Occupy Vancouver, five nights I slept out at Occupy Calgary. One of those nights is 30 degrees below zero and we're not allowed fire, we're not allowed power because we're too, so disgraceful that of course, you know, we're kind of uh, homeless, derelict addicts, you know all the, the, the uh, smear on, on Occupy. But I, as I've come to see Occupy, and I was on uh, the Pacifica station in Berkeley, uh, this Occupy movement is uh, emergency measures that we're living in a society where those in control are pointing us off an abyss, you know, financially, the war machine is completely unbridled, spreading around nuclear stuff, uh, new weapons that we don't even know about. According to Christopher Busby in his discussions with Jim Fetzer, uh, 
He's seen one of these weapons that makes a tank vaporize. Something to do with enrich, enriched uranium combined with deuterium. So, you know, the shoot, it, it goes way beyond depleted uranium. And the same people that built Fukushima, designed Fukushima, I mean, the key to understanding this whole phenomena is that the nuclear energy industry is the same as the nuclear weapons industry. It's the same people running it, it's the same conceptions behind it, and Fukushima now is a demonstration that the people running that industry have no respect whatsoever for human life, for human decency, for our children. You know, the contamination of our children. So as I'm watching uh, the news out of Japan, I'm, uh, you know, it's devastating. I have to say, as I started to put together what was going on, one of my first thoughts is, Japan is finished, as we've known it. I mean, on one level, the companies will never rebuild in that dangerous, the, these factories will never be rebuilt. But the deeper uh, uh, destruction of one of the you know, great, beautiful flowers of the human civilization, the Japanese civilization, is the Japanese people are being lied to. And the governments are not protecting, the government is not protecting them. Uh, and, and, and giving the news that people need to run for their lives or do what they need to do to protect their, their future generations. And the destruction is going to come that as the people at some point are going to figure out how badly they've been be betrayed and the authorities, the, the command structures of Japan will not be able to sustain the amount of damage that, that is being done uh, and allowed to be done. So, you know, my first thought as I'm, I'm trying to appreciate the magnitude of this is Tokyo has to be evacuated. How could you imagine evacuating Tokyo, 30 million people? I started to think, uh, this is 20 minutes left. left. Okay, 20 minutes, not too bad. I can <laughs> cover a lot in 20 minutes. <clears throat> Tokyo, uh, <clears throat> I, I love some water. I, I just, uh, I'm kind of a flustered finding uh, San Francisco State, let alone where this room was, uh, was uh, very challenging. I didn't have a car, and my cell phone, I'm from Canada, a little disconnect, so I just sort of uh, have arrived in here. So a, a little bit of, of, of water would be uh, really appreciated. But this, this uh, you know, I started to think, well, you know, could we uh, drive up some of those U.S. aircraft carriers and uh, put the Japanese people who want to flee, where would we take them? Well, maybe we could take them to beside James Bay. I know in Canada there's you know, huge areas with, with water uh, that are much less subject to radioactivity than, than Japan. And, and it seemed to me that as I was reading uh, you know, from California, from British Columbia, take this kind of pill, that kind of pill, there was something so troubling about it that people in California, British Columbia, have a right to say this is going to affect us and it is going to affect us and it is affecting us you know, every minute of every day. But surely common decency would call us to say the first priority has to be the people in the area, the people of Japan, all the people of Honshu Island. <clears throat> I mean, imagine living uh, 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers from from, uh, from this uh, devastation. And uh, uh, so, so that, that isn't, uh, that isn't uh, happening. So, so let me uh, get a little bit more uh, historical now. <clears throat> and let me just uh, come back to the idea that this liability issue, the, the fact that we, we don't really have any insurance, and in fact, we are the backup. And we take the health consequences and we take the financial consequences. And this is across the board in every sphere of our public life. Our public governments have been gutted by a criminal class, a kleptocratic class, who are running away now with the capital, thinking that they can find some enclaves uh, where, where, they're, they're, uh, be, well, they're, where they'll be protected. So I see this Occupy movement 
as essentially the conscious part of human beings, which is a small percentage, you know, given television, pharmaceutical drugs, illicit drugs, financial collapse, family pressures, you know, psych psychosis, how many, what percentage of society is left to have a rational discussion on any subject? Uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a small uh, percentage of, of people. Uh, but that percentage of people are finding that, well, we can't just say we're going to put some ideas into the existing system and hope that those in control absorb some of, the, of these ideas to save this rotting, sinking system. People are saying, no, it may be too little, too late, but let's meet in the quadrangle. Let's go to our public squares. Let's take the inspiration of Tahrir Square and the Arab Spring and go to wherever we can find some public space left uh, through all this privatization, try to get reacquainted as members of communities, try to invent some kind of governing procedures. Steve was very eloquent saying, imagine if these general assemblies are replicated. Imagine if, say, instead of what's on television being decided by corporate sponsors and the, essentially the war machine that owns these uh, media out outlets, Imagine we had general assemblies deciding what's going to be on our televisions, uh, in, in, in our newspapers. Uh, this model of, of general assemblies, if it replicated, no wonder the police state crackdown is coming on top of us. The, the models that are being created here are, are, are so important. And, and so the Fukushima case, to me, is an, uh, uh, the, almost the quint quintessential superlative demonstration of the failure of our leadership class and the huge consequences uh, on humanity that are coming to us and, the, and our future generations or lack of future generations because of the failure to take action in any constructive way. It's, it, it's a huge demonstration of why this Occupy movement is so, so important. And, and, and so, you know, Fukushima is, is a theme that must be included in, in, in all the litany of problems and issues that are so, uh, are, are at the danger point, the SOS point, the red alert point, where we can't fool around anymore. We have to mobilize as human beings, as citizens, citizens of uh, our, our, our localities, citizens of the world. And, and this Fukushima uh, example, uh, demonstrates that the nation state as we've known it can't go on this way. This myth of national sovereignty. Of course, the United States is really the only uh, polity that uh, really could uh, assert kind of, some kind of sovereignty. Imagine if I said, well, as a Canadian, I think we should have some, new, uh, some uh, military base, say here in California. Uh, you know, and yet the United States does this all over the world, especially in Japan. Uh, and of course, the, you know, the, the, as I was just trying to wrap my mind around this, the, the terrible poetry, you know, the, the tragic symmetry that the very population that had to absorb the meaning of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and had to deal with the early you know, beginnings of learning about the consequences of radioactivity and the permanence of the destruction in the human gene pool, that that very population is now the same population that is again the subject of a vast human experiment. But of course we're all guinea pigs now in this human experiment. You know, all our lives have been diminished and lessened as, as, as a result of a result of this. How to absorb that, keep our faith up, keep our confidence up, and, and, and reach out to one another and, and, and try to give one another the kind of courage we need to deal with what we're going to be going through in the weeks ahead, the months ahead. You know, as I was watching the live stream from Zuccotti Park, and it was really the next morning where the group had gone to some other park and then the police had put up a fence and somehow uh, declared it to be private property yet again. And, uh, you know, I saw the live stream going to a woman being arrested, falling out of her wheelchair, and then the police putting her in her wheelchair. And I saw these fences 
with this type of person on one side and that type of person supposedly on the other side, this kind of land tenure on one side, the other kind of land tenure on the other side. The, you know, it, 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 it's clear to me we are in civil war now. It has begun. That, you know, as I'm watching this, I'm saying, this is New York. You know, this is the commercial political capital, the, the informal empire capital of, of the world. This is New York. And to see in Calgary how offended some people are that conscientious youth put up some tents in a park and the kind of abuse, they might as well be call them Al-Qaeda, they might as well call them Black Bloc, they might as well call them Taliban, they might as well call them occupiers, to see how polarizing it is. And, 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 and part of the, the tyranny we're dealing with is this terrible division that our mainstream media and our, our propaganda experts, our psychological warfare experts, impose on humanity. So, so we're taught to hate one another. You call somebody Al-Qaeda, oh, they're no longer human. Anything can be, you call somebody Taliban, you call somebody Black Bloc, and you can see the same uh, methodology going, oh, that's a 9-11 truther, that's an occupier. These stories that have to be kept under cover, under reps, cannot be allowed to permeate and invade into the consciousness, you know, some measure of truth. So, you know, living in a world where the depicted reality every day in the newspapers, on the television, I turned off the television a long time ago, is so far from what you actually know to be the, the reality, the saving grace, the best news of, 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 of my lifetime, uh, or one of the best stories in the public arena at least, has been the internet. Because we can find our way to information on the internet. <clears throat> so let me, uh, uh, with what, 10 minutes to go, um, suggest a little bit about the paper uh, that I wrote. The, uh, this is, uh, I guess, a long uh, um, prelude or in, in introduction, but um, I, I'm a university professor. I work at a small university in Alberta, Canada. Alberta, Canada is the place with the tar sands. And uh, uh, I've been kind of a controversial someone in my home territory. I worked on Native American studies, as, as it's sometimes called here in the United States. And I kind of globalized the story of imperialism and colonization and looking at first at indigenous peoples in Canada, North America, but saying this, this colonization since 1492, uh, it's not uh, unique to North America. It happened in Africa, it happened in Asia. Japanese people, you know, interestingly, although colonized, learn to act like colonizers themselves. And if you say Korea or Manchuria, uh, you know, or honorary white person, I mean, this speaks to the very uh, interesting uh, history, uh, history of Japan. So I worked on these two volumes uh, for uh, 16 years. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the second volume is uh, called Earth into Property, Colonization, Decolonization, and Capitalism. And I try to sort of get out of the narrow confines of specialties at the university and say, well, okay, we've got our specialties and that's very important, but how does it all fit together? What's the bigger picture? What's the synthesis? And having gone through uh, that experience, suddenly uh, having that weight off my shoulders, then came uh, the, the earthquake, the tsunami, and what was by immediately the part of it that caught my attention and, and seemed to me this is way beyond the other aspects of this crisis, Fukushima. So I began to, uh, I, I went almost into a trance. And then when I learned there was 40 years of nuclear waste at that site, in the 80s I had uh, tried to fight uh, the building of a nuclear power plant in Ontario at Darlington. And it was the nuclear waste issues. Where are you going to put the nuclear waste? And the idea was, well, we'll put it up north in the Canadian Shield where there's not that many people. I was you know, a Native Studies pr professor and saying, oh yeah, so you put it where there's mostly Native people. You know, don't, don't we know that story? And that, that is the story. Where does the garbage, the toxic, the nuclear waste, where is it going to be directed? At the poor people, at the most marginalized people, the people who need, need jobs the worst. <clears throat> so so uh, 
uh, it was almost, uh, a, 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 I can hardly explain it, but within two weeks, I had a paper uh, from Hiroshima to Fukushima. And just to write down those words and sort of incorporate that I'm living this, that this tragedy from Hiroshima to Fukushima, that I'm one of the first to actually articulate this and try to give this expression. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's quite a long paper. It's largely a paper based on my looking into the history of nuclear energy in, in, in Japan. Uh, but uh, the big issue, it seemed to me, was because people won't accept nuclear waste, uh, nuclear processing plants in their cities, in their communities, all this activity has been confined to these early sites that were designated as nuclear sites. And when I heard that there's 40 years of nuclear waste, you've got a meltdown situation with massive pools of nuclear waste right there, uh, and then all the processing between, uh, you know, then the whole reprocessing. Then I learned about the plutonium going in from the French, you know, super uh, hyper uh, advanced, uh, in, in quotes, uh, technology. So you're putting this new age fuels in the most antique reactors in the world. I mean, there is so much criminal negligence here, deep down criminal negligence. We need to see some criminal charges really soon, and it doesn't just go to tech folks who are kind of the scapegoats. It goes ultimately to the White House, to the Commander-in-Chief, to Barack Obama, whose negligence, whose bought and paid for status, you know, especially to the nuclear industry and every other, you know, um, I, I have metaphors about prostitutes, but you know, prostitutes, sex trade workers, I don't want to demean them in talking about the, the, the corruption in that White House of your country, you know, the, the worldwide devastation and the lack of any uh, ability to take liability and responsibility for the crimes against humanity. The, you know, the, Dick Cheney comes to Canada at the Vancouver Club. We're there, we're saying, you got to arrest Dick Cheney, you got to arrest Dick Cheney. How come Dick Cheney can be living in the peaceful way that he does in your country? How come George Bush is living so peacefully here and able to play at the golf course and whatnot? What's wrong with this country? What is wrong? What does it take for the people to wake up in this country? And I'm not talking to you because you're here, you're woken up. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. But it's a shame. The United States is the most disgraceful display of human irresponsibility that is unimaginable what is allowed to happen here, what the people allow to happen here. And it's in my country too. Stephen Harper is just a colonial governor of the same system. And he's set up by the CIA, just like most of the other governments in the world of this country that feels entitled to intervene in everybody's self-determination and self-government and violates international laws as, as if it's nothing. And it's got to stop and we got to go to our Occupy camps and we got to get to know those young people who are holding the turf in our public places. So how did it happen that the nuclear plants got put on those spots and Japan. Well, I got into the story of Tsukumo Prison. All the Class A war criminals that were put, the, the leaders of Imperial Japan, that were put in that prison in Tokyo. This became the leadership of the U.S. colony that Japan became. So it's as if the, the rule in the United States, if you fight us well, as Nazi Germans, as Imperial Japan, if you show some good fighting capacity, we'll take you into our empire and we'll give you a sub-empire within our larger global empire. And that's, that's what happened. <clears throat> so this Matsutaro Shiriki is the first czar of nuclear power in, uh, in Japan. In uh, the imperial government, <clears throat> and I guess there is still the imperial government in Japan, but the pre-World World War II, as there is in Canada, the Queen of Elizabeth is still you know, head of state of Canada. We are a monarchy, too, in Canada. So, and I'm, I'm quite supportive of the monarchy myself, because it represents standing up against the United States 
and that we didn't go along with that project, that Indian fighting project in, in, in the United States to do the Western expansion through, uh, through genocide. We, we came to that later on and did our own form of genocide in the Western expansion. Uh, <clears throat> but this uh, shariki had been a combination of, say, William Randolph Hearst and uh, J. Edgar Hoover, a kind of police chief, media operative. And I think that's how it works now. We saw it with Rupert Murdoch and Fox News, you know, that the police and the media are kind of, they run our society essentially. I don't say that they decide, of, you know, they're really the deciding agency. They have people, Rupert Murdoch is not at the top of the feeding chain of command and control. But the media and the police work together and the, and the, and the politicians just play extra roles, kind of like playing on a role in a, in, a, in a Sunday afternoon or an afternoon soap opera. You know, our, our, our uh, elected officials have been taken, taken from us. <clears throat> so, of course, in the anti-communist atmosphere after World War II, uh, with the U.S. Uh, taking over the Nazi uh, opposition to uh, uh, Soviet-based uh, uh, communism, uh, Shariki was a perfect... Uh, uh, agent for that anti-communist thrust and I've got one minute <clears throat> and uh, so he got the first TV license after being a class A war criminal then comes McCarthy then comes uh, Red China uh, Korean War uh, they're rushing to find really good anti-communist uh, uh, Japanese he gets the first television license Nippon television license and the first uh, campaign that Nippon Television does is a promotion of nuclear energy in Japan. And it was quite a sell given the memory people had and the experience people had of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But because of the peace provision in the Japanese constitution, sort of imposed on them by the United States, it became a kind of mythological thing. Well, we don't do nuclear weapons. We do nuclear e energy for peace. And it became very central to the psychology of restoring Japanese pride and honor as a scientific uh, leader and also uh, as a very loyal uh, member of the American empire who would toe the line on communism and make sure trade unions and, and such uh, uh, didn't uh, come to affect the older sort of feudal system, the zeibatsu uh, system. So, so uh, let's be very conscious of the connection. Who was at the first festival in, uh, in Japan that was played up on television in cartoons was Ernest Lawrence, the Berkeley professor with his cyclotron at, at, at uh, the University of California. He was one of the early promoters brought into Japan. Uh, and so, you know, as I'm at Berkeley, there's the free speech movement, but there's also the history of Berkeley's relationship to atomic uh, uh, technology and, and that's a big part of Ber Berkeley's uh, uh, identity and personality and Berkeley should be getting out in front. What's wrong with that place? Why are those professors so quiet about everything? You know, the, uh, the media and the academy, we're at the trough. This is one of the darkest eras in the history of the academy. The, the, the ease with which you can shut tenured professors up through the offer of contracts, the promise of contracts, uh, the promise of some media exposure, this, this kind of thing. So that's basically uh, how it came to be that, there, that the population were drawn along to at least allow and consent to nuclear energy. Uh, we still see a kind of compliant naivety, uh, kind of um, servant-like uh, a respect for those in authority in Japan to this day. Uh, I mean, it's pretty clear. We, we've seen some great rallies, uh, some evidence of some uh, conscious part of the Japanese who have been standing up. They stood up to the nuclear en energy industry all along. Uh, uh, but, you know, Japan, I have to say, has sort of been the model uh, for the corporate rule, the corporatist uh, approach uh, to, to government, governance and giving over all the power and stripping out our public governments to give it to the corporate uh, authorities 
that run uh, their agencies on a not really a profit motive because they're mostly monopolies that just kind of claim public assets a as their own. There's, it's not a really uh, competitive uh, reality at the highest levels of, of the economy. Uh, but nevertheless, that's where the power lies now, and uh, we're all allowing it to happen, maybe a little less so than in the past. And uh, with that, those words, I'll say thank you very much for hearing me out for this time. <laughs> A short amount of time for questions and uh, comments uh, between now and lunch. So, questions, comments? Uh, yes. I'm Mary Beth Brangan from uh, the Ecological Options Network. And I'm just wondering um, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, did you bring any copies of your paper? The uh, paper is uh, published on many sites now, but it uh, was originally published on Veterans Today, okay. which is uh, a site for veterans, for ex-military people. And uh, so uh, if you look up uh, Anthony J. Hall, Hiroshima to Fukushima, 1945 to 2011, hey, we're still in 2011. These are still early, early days. We've got a, you know, just because we're small in number right now, everything starts somewhere. Uh, so we're still in 2011. Um, and it came out on March the 28th. So wow. March, the, March the 11th to March the 28th. Fast. That was fast. Um, I just uh, was reading about the uh, connection between the Prescott Bush cabal and the, um, those folks back then pressuring um, the Japanese uh, to take the, the, uh, in the nuclear industry. I also wanted to um, ask you, since you're both an advocate for the Occupy movement as well as um, uh, Native Indigenous rights, what you might think about the suggestion by um, some Indigenous leaders who uh, are very sensitive to the word occupy and who would rather have this movement call, be called uh, decolonize. Yes, well I did write a book called Colonization, uh, Decolonization and Capitalism and a uh, close friend of mine, uh, Sarah Scout, who has been doing Occupy Calgary, she has a website called Decolonize Calgary. Uh, in a way, I mean, occupation, no, we live here. These are our places. We are inhabiting our own public places. So this movement, let's start it as Occupy. It gave a, a common currency. We know what we're talking about, unless we're talking about the West Bank, and then that word takes on a different meaning, or if we're talking about Japan between 1945 and 1952. Uh, in a way, uh, okay, let, we start there, but we're starting to inhabit our places. And yesterday I got the news from um, Calgary that uh, the Occupy group that I've most identified myself with was in court getting the eviction notice, and they actually got a good uh, treatment by the judge. And uh, so uh, they, the judge didn't just immediately say, here's the eviction notice. Uh, the municipal bylaws trump the Constitution of Canada. Uh, so, so uh, uh, not you know, it could be that some good news comes out of it. Sarah Scout put a little teepee. She built a little teepee in the Occupy camp. In the in, I call it the human rights habitation. And uh, so, in our Constitution, which was patriated in 1982, the Constitution Act 1982, sections one to 34 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms which speak about individual rights or rights like freedom of assembly, free speech. Section 35, which I fought for hard and others did, uh, says the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. So we got that into the trial. So her TP in the park uh, raises these deep issues. Of, well, what about the reality if we're saying, oh, you're trespassers, well, what about from the indigenous people's point of view? And in British Columbia, where I, where I was at uh, uh, Occupy Vancouver, 
Uh, we have treaties in Canada. There were treaties in the United States until 1971, 1871, and then a law was passed so that those areas uh, for which no treaties had been made uh, are within the United States by virtue of conquest. And uh, uh, the California is in a kind of uh, strange situation in that treaties have been made but not approved by two-thirds vote of the, the Senate. Um, so, uh, so the indigenous peoples, and of course indigenous peoples in the Americas and the receiving end of colonization, their experience is more typical of the majority of people in the world, including the Japanese, who experience imperialism, colonization, as something coming at them, as a menace coming at them, rather than how my ancestors did, for instance, as, as an expansion of opportunities. And the vast majority of people here in North America who have uh, immigrant roots experience uh, colonization and imperialism as an expansion of opportunities. And here we are in the promised lands of the promised land, California, uh, where, where you know, it's a fully immigra immig immigration society. The indigenous people, you know, this is one of the most gen ethnically cleansed part of the world. This is one of the parts of the world where the history of genocide is most strong. This is the most genocidally, uh, could I say, contaminated uh, 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 lands. And, 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 and the, the good people of California, I think, have, haven't really dealt with that. In British Columbia, which is sort of our version in Canada of California, we have a, you know, a, a regime of treaty making to this day, and treaties are being made in British Columbia. They, they weren't made for a long period of time because that part of the world had the British Navy behind the colonizing uh, force. So the British Navy meant that the, the colonizers felt, felt sort of secure with the indigenous peoples and didn't make treaties. So we've raised that in the context of Occupy Vancouver, and, it, and, and of course, it's hard to get that recognition into, into it, but maybe you can help us with that. Okay. Well, uh, I was wondering, in addition to your paper, could you suggest some sources, resources, for people who are interested in learning more about the history of uh, the development of nuclear power in Japan? Uh, well, if you go to um, uh, my paper, it's well footnoted. Okay. Uh, and most of the material I got off the internet and quite a bit of the material is uh, written by Japanese. It's been tr translated. Uh, it's very interesting to read the history of television in Japan and how deeply that was part of uh, the anti-communist fervor and preoccupation in the United States. And of course, uh, you know, the, the key, one of the key things about this whole thing, this GE Mark I reactor, this General Electric Mark I reactor, is the very prototype developed for the Nautilus submarine by Rickover. You know, the first use of uh, nuclear energy after Hiroshima and Nagasaki was to run submarines. I hadn't realized until I did the research. Uh, you, you, in World War II, submarines could only go about 20 miles underwater through batteries. You can't run a diesel underwater. So that was the first objective. And the Navy had been left out of the Manhattan Project. So getting the, uh, getting the uh, nuclear submarine, and, and you, got, you had this very high, um, highly motivated, I guess he was brilliant, uh, Rickover overseeing it, uh, and he became a kind of a missionary. He took on an evangelical fervor to get the uh, technology of, of nuclear energy out into the world, to take it out of secrecy at the shipping port uh, demonstration plant in Pennsylvania. And of course the Japanese then copied it with their own uh, demonstration uh, facility in, uh, in, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, can we, I know we're out of time. I, I can't. One more question. One more question. Okay. Okay. Who, who, Sorry, who in the back. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned Hi, I'm Bruce. Um, you mentioned the GE Mark I reactor. Uh, sometimes I get confused uh, because of corporate mergers and all, but is, isn't Toshi, does Toshiba make reactors? Some of the more recent reactors? Could you discuss the various reactor manufacturers of reactors in Japan? 
And then, you know, and then it was Westinghouse who was working with Rickover. So how uh, GE got the Westinghouse patents, I, I'm not really sure. But um, Toshiba, Hitachi, uh, it, you know, in, in, in the empire, it seems that Japan was being assigned, well, you, you can develop some expertise and, so, and, and we'll let you uh, do the, the uh, nuclear energy side of things. So the indigenous uh, Japanese companies took over some of the technology, worked on some of the technology. So, so they're, they're very much uh, involved. And it's such a demonstration that you know, most of our economy spins out of, this uh, out of this military research and military development. Most of our civilian economy is just spin-offs from uh, what is at the heart of the political economy. Uh, the um, military industrial complex, which has the media and the mind pollution and the toxification of the mental environment at its very core. One of the things that people should be aware of is uh, Toshiba and Hitachi bought patents from GE and they were planning a major expansion of nuclear power plants just before Fukushima was destroyed and their efforts, which we'll learn later today, to expand uh, both the uh, export of nuclear waste into Mangol uh, Mongolia, other countries, and also the expansion of nuclear plants in Vietnam and other countries throughout the world, particularly Asian countries, mm -hmm. as a solution to their energy problems. So I think, do we have time for one more question? Okay, yes. Gene, if you want to introduce yourself. Oh, uh, my name is uh, Eagle that flies from the Sweetwater people of the Cheyenne Nation. Uh, adopted by the Kiowa and by uh, the Diné people of Big Mountain. So I honor my ancestors by saying Hi, that John. here today. And uh, <coughs> my Christian name is Gene Stone. Well. Uh, your mouth. Your so I represent uh, Residence Organized for a Safe Environment, and uh, one of the comments that you made. I think that that we need to go back to revisit just just for a moment is uh, this concept that so much trouble uh, has been perpetrated on us as human beings from the very beginning of time by people who say that um, they are invested by the Creator to rule us and that you're the servants and you work for us and those governments and kings and queens have been replaced by corporations at this point. Uh, but I want to say that it's very important for us as human beings to realize that those were lies. Those were not true. And that we have to take responsibility and with our own actions. And so we have to go from here with that awareness to uh, understand that we have to take back we have to occupy the environment, the world, and this is up to us, and we have to do it. Thank you. Thank you.